So today I'm going to be talking about rational romanticism, which is uh, the idea of merging science and imagination uh, to build the future. All right, so the next hundred years represent the most crucial time in history. Currently, we're facing a lot of existential perils, like climate change, infectious disease, uh, catastrophic war that might involve bioterrorism, nuclear weapons, etc. But we possess the tools to save our future. And so, by merging science and this, this romance of the imagination, we can build tomorrow. So, just to start off, um, I'd like to give a nice little illustration, this spider. Uh, this spider could perch on the tip of my finger, but she contains more functional components than an aircraft carrier. We have the potential to engineer structures and systems and machines that can rival and even exceed the complexity of this spider. Uh, because as humans, we possess the ability to simulate our, I, to simulate our, our, our designs in our minds and, to, and then to implement those simulations into reality and construct them. All right, so just to give you guys a little bit of background, I'd like to talk about uh, some of the exponential trends in technology. Um, some, of the, some of this might already be familiar to many of you, but for those of you who are not familiar, um, I'm just going to go over some of this stuff to give you a little bit of background, since it is definitely something that, uh, if you're not already familiar with it, can be uh, rather surprising. All right, so exponential trends in technological change are indicating that we may reach uh, a technological singularity at some point in the near future. Uh, some, most notably uh, Raymond Kurzweil, have posited this for 2045, um, but I would, I would estimate based on trends in neuroengineering specifically that it'd be closer perhaps to 2100, um, uh, just given a conservative estimate. Um, so what is the technological singularity? Um, it's a point in time when when uh, technological change, especially change related to the develop development of engineering intelligence itself, uh, and this may or may not be uh, software-based uh, artificial intelligence, um, as I'll talk about in a minute, um, but engineering intelligence itself uh, allows for the construction of machines which can recursively self-improve and lead to an intelligence explosion. Uh, and at this point, there would be changes in our lives that are so profound that uh, it would, it, I mean, it would change every aspect of our lives. And things like mind uploading and uploaded astronauts going out and exploring the universe and so on and so forth might become a real possibility. Um, so some evidence for uh, this exponential change. Um, uh, you can see here in uh, uh, a plot modified from Kurzweil's The Singularity is Near. Um, this is describing the uh, increase in hardware capacity, specifically flops or calculations per second per $1,000. Um, and uh, this is a little out of date because the book was published in 2005, but it's been updated since then. Uh, however, this was one of the nicer plots, uh, so I decided to modify this one. Um, basically, uh, we're reaching the point when, in terms of pure hardware capacity uh, and brute force computation, uh, based on uh, if we're taking neurons as anatomical units that have that are simplified to the point where it's cellular scale but not molecular scale, we're looking at uh, we're we're pretty much at the point where we could hypothetically simulate an insect brain. Um, we're reaching uh, the point where we could simulate a mouse brain, and we may be approaching uh, a human brain, especially with exascale computing, depending on what you, uh, depending on how simplified uh, you want to make your neurons. Um, and then uh, the trends are, are going farther even, and uh, Kurzweil suggests, like I said earlier, that by 2045 we could reach a point where billions of human brains could be simulated uh, in a computer that only costs $1,000. Um, some other trends are present in nanotechnology. Uh, you can see over there uh, the size of mechanical devices. Uh, miniaturization is rapidly increasing as well. Uh, the number of nanotechnology patents. Um, and then uh, things in synthetic biology uh, and biotechnology in general, the cost of DNA sequencing as well as the cost to write DNA, um, that is to chemically synthesize DNA base pairs and string them together. Uh, usually that happens by a process of uh, doing shorter segments of oligonucleotides and then, uh, and, and then overlapping them and uh, uh, synthesizing the rest, but uh, I digress. All right. <laughs> So, um, as I was discussing, uh, the singularity may or may not be driven by non-biological artificial superintelligence. And I would actually propose that it would be ideal for humans and machines to work alongside one another. Um, so just to uh, sort of whimsically uh, describe this, the 
I've outlined a few possible singularities. Uh, cyber singularity would be the more uh, uh, AI-based singularity, purely AI. Um, neuro singularity would be a singularity that involves neural implants, like this uh, uh, fairly um, out there uh, diagram that I put together to just sort of illustrate what something like that might look like. And in this way, people would, uh, uh, people and uh, computers would sort of uh, uh, merge together and help each other uh, reach a state of superintelligence. Uh, and nano singularity would involve strong nanotechnology, uh, sort of Drexler's original vision for nanotechnology, in which uh, molecular assemblers and utility fog, the sort of the uh, fog of nanomachines that would allow for uh, object, complex objects to be built uh, on a whim, um, and thing and self, even self-replicating nanomachines that are obviously controllable so they don't get out of hand would become commonplace. Uh, a biosingularity would be more along the lines of biologically based enhancements, um, but probably most likely it'll be some combination of these things if we reach this point. It'll be uh, uh, so, some, some different mix of this. So um, now that I've given you some background on that, um, obviously this is, the, the, we're, we're facing all these great uh, uh, existential risks, but we also have uh, great opportunities. And if we do this properly, we could reach a cosmic tomorrow. Um, but. Uh, but of course, we do have to avoid things like uh, hostile artificial superintelligence. We have to avoid things like uh, infectious disease and antibiotic resistance running rampant in the meantime. So what will we need to reach this future? And I'm proposing uh, several key components, uh, together which, uh, together I'm calling this rational romanticism. And these include imagination and a sense of wonder, um, obsessive determination to work towards these goals, um, communication across STEM and the arts to facilitate cultural support. And I'll be talking about a lot about this later. Um, so right now there, there, there's a fair amount of uh, clashing between uh, some, of the more, some of the more humanistic pursuits and the more technical pursuits. And uh, we really need to, in order to uh, make the possibilities of things like human enhancement and uh, these kinds of very radical changes a little bit more palatable, we will want to help illustrate why we have this passion for them, why it's, why it's not necessarily this coldly mechanistic thing. And then, of course, with all of that, we need scientific rigor and we need collaboration because we can't just uh, we we can't just come up with all these wild things and then just expect them to happen. We actually have to do the hardcore engineering to make them happen. All right. So to start off, I'll be talking about building the future with visionary engineering. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, when humans cognitively simulate these abstract poss possibilities, uh, we can we can then later implement them. Um, so abstract possibilities with high emotional salience um, are, are, there's research that shows that these sorts of possibilities are more likely to be realized. Um, especially, I mean, just consider, like, if you have some sort of goal in mind, some sort of big vision behind what you're doing, you're a lot more likely to stick to it and have that kind of obsessive determination, that kind of uh, drive to really make your vision into reality. And so um, there's definitely some research to support that this is an important component. Um, it should also be noted that the simulations also must incorporate process because if you're if you're only including things that are related to uh, the, if you're only including uh, like the end goal, uh, you're more likely to be disillusioned and to sort of fall off the pro the trail eventually because you're not going to be taking concrete steps towards these end goals. Um, so you have to have both. Um, so now I'd like to give a couple of examples of what I consider to be visionary engineering. Um, so I recently had the pleasure of, actually, uh, Ed Boyden visited CU Boulder recently, and so I got to meet him in person there. Uh, I also had the pleasure of meeting some of his grad students uh, at the MIT Media Lab, uh, where his laboratory is located. Um, uh, the MIT Media Lab is a larger organization uh, within MIT that uh, Ed Boyden's lab is part of. Um, and I had the opportunity to speak with some of his grad students about various topics uh, while I was visiting there, as well as to meet him when he was visiting Boulder. Um, anyway. So Ed Boyden has stated such things as that he seeks to solve the brain and even map all of biology for engineering purposes. And um, in, in, in some interviews, he's even talked about using this kind of knowledge to eliminate suffering and find existential purpose. Obviously, very big goals, very dramatic goals, very uh, great vision there. Um, 
But at the same time, he has uh, helped to pioneer a lot of technologies that take concrete steps towards these goals. Um, and in particular, just to give a little context, uh, these kinds of things might help towards uh, both neural implants and towards um, building more human-like machines, uh, and so on and so forth, uh, as well as just for uh, therapeutic purposes, like. Uh, 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 clinical uh, treatment of, uh, uh, of mental illness and so on and so forth. Um, so some examples are optogenetics, which is a brilliant technology in which uh, neurons are engineered to express ion channels that respond to particular wavelengths of light. And uh, using, if you use a fiber optic or nanophotonics or something along these lines, uh, you, can, uh, you, you can activate or inhibit certain neurons in the brain uh, uh, simply by uh, applying these pulses of light, um, uh, assuming that you've engineered the neurons to express the channels. Um, and so this is very useful for uh, both studying the brain and potentially for future interfaces with the brain. Um, another great technology that he's pi helped pioneer is uh, uh, expansion microscopy, which you can see a, a modified figure uh, from one of his papers about it uh, over here. And basically what expansion microscopy does is it uses uh, chemical and electrophoretic <coughs> treatments to physically expand samples of neural tissue. And uh, the samples of neural tissue, uh, like you could take, for insta instance, a rat brain and then treat it with this process, and uh, it'll actually get bigger. Uh, and then, because of this, it is easier to image using techniques like super-resolution microscopy, um, and you can get very nice high-resolution images like this one. Um, and so, it's really, it, it's really great because of that. Um, and uh, hmm, there was something else I was going to say about that, but whatever. Uh, anyway, so another thing that he uh, has uh, innovated is a process called automated patch clamping. And of course, it should be noted that this is a, his lab is highly collaborative. There's a lot of people involved, so I want to give credit to everyone. Um, they, there's more than 40 people in his lab alone, and there's also, um, there's also uh, collaborating labs outside. So um, when I say he, I'm sort of referring to this as the broad he in the sense that he's leading a lot of these efforts, but uh, there's a lot more uh, going on underneath. Um, anyway, automated patch clamping uh, is very useful uh, because um, oh yeah, I was going to say, sorry, about the um, uh, expansion microscopy, just for mapping the brain and understanding the brain. Obviously, this could take huge leaps towards that, uh, since it, it may be uh, uh, a, a one of the processes which we use towards developing a full brain wiring diagram. Uh, anyway, back to automated patch clamping. Uh, automated patch clamping um, is more for studying functional activity in the brain. And uh, in this, uh, Boyden and his collaborators were able to design a robot which uses both two-photon microscopy, um, which is a special type of fluorescence microscopy, and um, a patch clamp, which, is, if you're not already aware, is a uh, method of measuring neural uh, electric electrical activity from neurons, uh, individual neurons. Um, and so this robot, robot will uh, take a sample of neural tissue and um, it, will, it, it will apply the patch clamp and at the same time observe what it's doing using uh, the microscope. And then uh, because the patch clamping device can uh, mechanically perturb the neural tissue, uh, it ends up leading to this, uh, it, 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 sometimes when human experimenters are doing it, uh, it, it can be very challenging because it ends up leading to the tissue being shifted around and potentially damaged and so on, and that can uh, get in the way of the measurements. And so what this robot does is it takes images in real time and continuously adjusts for those perturbations in order to rapidly and, uh, and effectively uh, look, examine neural activity. Um, and again, this is uh, sort of moving towards understanding the brain, um, which has all, all, all manner of applications, as I have described. Um, so a lot of great stuff going on there. Um, another example of visionary engineering is the Human Brain Project, which was uh, originally initiated by Henry Markram. Uh, he's a, he was a South African scientist who uh, uh, started up this Human Brain Project. Uh, it was originally called the Blue Brain Project. Um, at this point, it is uh, funded with $1.3 billion. Uh, it's one of the two European flagship projects. Um, and, the, uh, and basically, the original goal was uh, simulating a, a brain in a supercomputer. And uh, Markram has a great TED talk about that. Um, and so this, this kind of vision um, it, it ha, ha, has led to, to, to this very large enterprise contributing a lot to our knowledge of neuroscience. Um, and so 
Uh, basically, what it's accomplished so far is uh, it's built uh, in 2006. There was a when it was called Blue Brain Project. It built a uh, 10,000 neuron uh, biologically accurate model of a rat neocortical column. Uh, and a cortical column is a unit of uh, neural tissue that uh, uh, has certain circuit motifs that repeat across the cortex. And of course, there's some variations as you enter different cortical areas, but uh, it tends to um, it, it does tend to exhibit very similar structures as, as this unit repeats. And so they were able to simulate this 10,000 neuron unit and glean some interesting computational insights from that uh, relative to how, how, how it functions. Uh, later on, uh, I, I think it was 2015, there was a paper, and that's where I uh, pulled this figure from. Well, it was actually several different several different figures from this paper that I put together here. Um, just to illustrate, uh, they were able to reconstruct a cortical meso circuit, which is several cortical columns. This one, I think, had about 31,000 neurons involved, and uh, simulate that and continue to advance the project. So um, it should be noted that the Human Brain Project did undergo, uh, somewhat recently, uh, sort of a shift in direction, because the Human Brain Project was too uh, focused on theoretical and computational methods, and it didn't have enough experimental backup to continue uh, emulating larger and larger neural structures. And so they've been trying to incorporate more of a diversity of different uh, approaches, including more experimental approaches to gather the necessary wiring data and the necessary functional data to really gain a good idea of how, 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 how it works biologically before moving on to uh, the, the simulation aspects. And of course, they're still doing some simulation aspects, but um, it, it's a little bit more of a, uh, a broad approach at this point. Um, so while the Human Brain Project may or may not uh, reach the goal of, um, of actually simulating a human brain in a supercomputer. It has definitely done an amazing amount to, uh, s to spark off a lot of other projects, uh, like the China Brain Project, um, the uh, Brain Minds Project. Uh, I think the Brain Initiative was likely somewhat inspired by this, uh, since that I believe happened in 2013. Um, the, I think Brain Minds was in Japan. There's various. There, there's actually several different ones uh, across various countries that uh, have begun the, this race towards um, tor towards developing computational and uh, 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 sort of fully fully wired up models of the brain. And a lot of the, and, and the different contributions from these different projects that are beginning to accelerate uh, may eventually reach that goal of uh, having having a, a whole brain emulation. So. Um, now I'm going to shift uh, into another topic. Um, so we've talked about uh, applying these big visions to engineering. Um, I'd like to discuss artistic communication and communicating with the public in order to gain more support for uh, some of these some of these futuristic goals that to many might seem might seem a little frightening at first and somewhat de detached from human values. However, as I will describe, it doesn't have to be that way. So um, unfortunately, the arts and humanities. Uh, Perhaps I shouldn't have said almost universally, but it definitely is very frequent um, that the arts and humanities will take kind of a hostile stance towards science and technology. Um, uh, you'll see a lot of news articles as well as a lot of academic articles in the humanities uh, taking a very suspicious, uh, suspicious perspective on these types of things. Um, I've run across hundreds, if not thousands, of such, su such instances online, as well as just in talking to people, especially uh, I, was, I was actually at Dartmouth um, for a while. I'm not there any longer. Uh, I'm at CU now, but um, I was at Dartmouth for a while. And uh, since Dartmouth is a liberal arts college, there were a lot of people who were very suspicious of futuristic ideas. And so, um, e even among the faculty, and so, uh, and, and, and I mean, I, I've definitely noticed that there is this element of, of our culture that, 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 that is kind of unfortunate. And some primary criticisms emerge. Um, of course, the precautionary principle, uh, this one I'll just touch on briefly, um, is just the idea that some risks might be too risky to take. Um, especially associated with technology, and um, uh, to that I would just counter that with, well, we're facing a lot of existential uh, crises, or not crises, existential threats right now that are, are uh, th that are sort of pushing us the other way. Um, it will be, I if we are inactive, if we, we do not take these risks, that in itself is an immense risk and uh, outweighs the risks of uh, taking action through these technologies. Um, there's also some association with greed and oppression uh, that comes, uh, especially with, with relation to technology, out of some of these uh, humanities publications, which is unfortunate. Um, and that itself sort of stems from the idea that technology is detached from human emotions, that it's somehow this cold, mechanistic monster that's just going to eat everyone. And so, um, 
what I'd like to do here is to talk about how we can begin to counter this, and, and to, uh, because as, as I'm sure many of you are in uh, technology-related fields um, and, and science, I mean, there definitely is an emotional side to technology. There is these visions, there's, there's this idea, this very humanistic pursuit of trying to build the future and build a better future and build a future in which our relationship with technology is, is, is a positive one. Um, and so we have to communicate that emotional side of technology, the soul of the machine. Um, and so, so some ways that we can do this. Um, uh, so there's speculative poetry uh, and optimistic uh, science fiction, uh, digital humanities, and technology itself is art. Um, digital humanities is a uh, emerging discipline in which people from the sciences and the humanities uh, cross-pollinate uh, in their methods. And so they're studying things like uh, cultures and history, um, and they're using scientific methods at the same time. And so there's more of a conversation going on between between people from these different disciplines, which is great. And it can help us to understand that, I mean, we're all, we're, we're all, we're all people who are, who are looking for something. We're all people who are looking towards, towards a better world. And so we're, and, and so, and, and so it's, it, it, it kind of humanizes the, the scientists um, for the people who might not necessarily think of the scientists as being um, as, as emotionally in touch. And then um, going back to some of the particular artistic things that one can do, um, there's uh, uh, technology as art itself. I mean, creating technology, that's creating something new. You can design things, um, you, can, you can build things in, you have to consider how the technology will impact the human. Um, it's very, it, it's a very creative pursuit, and I mean, even just aesthetic things in how the technology is designed, even things as simple as uh, creating figures for scientific publications. Uh, I, I, there, there's definitely, especially in, in uh, some of the pr pr publications like Frontiers and Nature and Neuron, um, there, there, there's some quite beautiful <coughs> figures, and um, that in itself takes a, a degree of, uh, of artistic, uh, artistic planning and artistic thinking. Um, so anyway, uh, I'm going to be talking a little bit more about speculative poetry and optimistic science fiction. Um, so, uh, so far as that goes, um, speculative poetry is uh, can can include fantasy and sci-fi poetry, but um, I'm going to be mainly focusing on sci-fi poetry here. Uh, so, speculative poetry involves uh, just the, um, the these more imaginative leaps taking these imaginative leaps in poetry and, uh, and, and, then, and then bringing these ideas from science and technology into the poems themselves. Uh, and sort of the positive emotional resonance that one can bring in if you're, if you're writing a more optimistic form of this uh, can really upend the assumption that uh, science and technology has to be separate from emotion because it's, 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 it, if you have emotions in inherently embedded in the ideas. I mean, you're taking individual words and individual ideas that are commonly associated with the hardcore technical, and you're you're putting them into a context that is much more literary. You can you, you can begin to you can begin to move towards that emotional resonance. And so, um, in this example, uh, Vince Gotera's uh, space opera is a concrete poem, a poem with shape um, that you can sort of see a rocket ship here. Um, and it, ha it sort of brings the romance of that into it. Uh, the red-orange blast of his engines glows like morning, a little harbinger of hope in stormy darkness. Obviously a very, uh, very poetic, it is a poem after all. Um, Vince Gotera, just to give a little background, he's a Filipino-American poet uh, who is uh, pretty well known and he's active in the speculative poetry community as well. Um, and so um, bringing this kind of romance into it is, is very important. Um, uh, it should be noted that there actually already is a fair amount of spacecraft-related uh, romance out there, um, and so what I'd really like to see is I'd like to see some more um, some some more uh, poetry that that brings in ideas around things like synthetic biology and neuroengineering and artificial intelligence and uh, and so on and, and nanotechnology. Uh, in order to, because I mean, these are these are some of the technologies that are, are really shaping our future, and of course, space travel as well. But I mean, uh, there's there's definitely a lot of ground to explore, and some of these things are a little more abstract, and so, um, and I mean, in part because there hasn't been as much uh, focus on describing them through the arts, and so um, I, I would definitely say that it's important to bring in uh, the, the these romantic ideas. Uh, surrounding nanotechnology and synthetic biology and artificial intelligence and neuroengineering, uh, so that we can we, we can start to we, we, we can start to bridge the gap between the sciences and humanities and make this something that that, that hum humans as a whole are excited about rather than frightened by. Um, so, 
Yeah, all right. So some personal efforts towards building the future. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about my research and my writing uh, and sort of tie back to some of the other stuff we've discussed. Um, so as uh, was mentioned in my introduction uh, by Trent, uh, I, I've been working on synthetic biology research for about five years now, um, and uh, what I'm aiming to do is combat antibacterial resistance, one of the, which is heavily involved one of those existential threats of infectious disease, uh, using a de novo, uh, not found anywhere in nature, the sequence that is, uh, antimicrobial peptide, which I dubbed OPAL, um, and a bacterial conjugation delivery system for the gene encoding OPAL. And basically how this works is that I designed this antimicrobial peptide, uh, which is highly hydrophobic, so when it's in the aqueous environment of the cell, it aggregates, uh, it clumps together, and it uh, disrupts bacterial homeostasis, causing chaos in the bacteria, and uh, broadly, uh, broadly throwing off their systems uh, in a way that's quite different from traditional antibiotics, which tend to target specific macromolecular target sites, which can easily be changed <laughs> through mutations. Um, and so, uh, and, and, and so this is a, a new approach to antibiotic resistance, which has potential for uh, making it more difficult for resistance to develop since it uses this different mechanism that uh, is much broader. And then I also developed this uh, bacterial conjugation delivery system, which basically is uh, bacterial conjugation is a process by which um, bacteria, uh, donor bacteria carrying uh, uh, plasmids, uh, conjugative plasmids, uh, which are circular pieces, usually circular pieces of DNA, um, will transfer the uh, DNA to recipients, and then um, and, and in the natural setting or in the environmental setting, uh, the recipient. Th this has been. This has actually been taken advantage of by bacteria to spread antibiotic resistance. But here, I'm co-opting this in order to uh, transfer the uh, transfer the antimicrobial. Uh, encoding gene to recipient bacteria, and what I've been able to show is that this uh, this uh, can kill off uh, a significant portion of the recipient population um, when you mix together donor bacteria carrying the artificial gene uh, encoding opal with the recipients. Um, and just for targeting purposes, I've developed a promoter-based targeting, and that's just basically what that just means is that uh, when the uh, artificial gene is transferred into recipient bacteria, uh, it's turned on once it's in the recipients, but it's not turned on once in the donors, so the donors remain unharmed. And this is also good because uh, it could potentially allow us to uh, do less harm to indigenous microbiota in the human body, which is a major issue with traditional antibiotics. Um, so I'm also uh, just starting out with a project uh, in connectomics, uh, trying to understand the brain by, uh, uh, by mapping the wiring. And um, I'm developing a nanotechnology-based contrast agent for X-ray tomographic brain mapping. And um, this could be, th this, this might have the, uh, this might be able to be developed into something that would be biocompatible enough, um, using things like PEG and such. Um, I won't go into too much detail here, but uh, it might be able to be developed in a way that would allow biocompatibility so that we could start to map neural structures in living organisms, which could be great for developing uh, neural prostheses that attempt to emulate specific uh, parts, of, uh, parts of the brain. Um, even down to the point of specific, um, and this is more of a far off vision, but even down to the point of specific uh, uh, individuals, uh, individual people, you might be able to, for instance, uh, if somebody lost a chunk of their brain, you might be able to, uh, if you were, if this person had had their brain mapped earlier, you might be able to uh, uh, program a neural prosthesis to emulate that specific chunk based on the mapping that you had done earlier, and uh, then replace them. <coughs> Uh, in that sense. And of course, um, my bigger vision towards this would be towards something like mind uploading, um, in which you would gradually replace the brain with neural prostheses, and then eventually um, I I I eventually uh, transition into a neurosingularity style situation uh, where humans and machines uh, merge and we can go out and explore the universe uh, as uploaded astronauts. And um, so obviously very far off, but uh, it's, it's something that, that I'm just beginning to take steps towards and I'm very excited about. Um, so I also communicate uh, with writing, um, and I recently, uh, this, that's not this one, but uh, I recently published a poem in an Australian international publication called Andromeda Spaceways Magazine, um, it, it called, and this poem that I wrote is called The Sonata Machine, and it, it takes this perspective on, um, on human evolution and, uh, and, and sort of human destiny in the universe, uh, a, a very romantic perspective of what might happen and sort of moving towards uh, what in some circles is known as an omega point in which the entire universe might be saturated with intelligence and uh, and and it's uh, 
it, it's pretty out there, but um, I, I bring it together in a way that um, it, it is very interesting. And so uh, you can actually find this if you search for the poem online, the Sonata Machine. Um, I, it, at least for now, they, they put up a free PDF of the Andromeda Spaceways issue, so a little self-promotion there, but um, uh, it's, uh, it, I, I, I like it, I like it, it's pretty cool. Anyway, um, so uh, I'm also working on a sci-fi novel called Arachne, uh, it's currently a draft, um, and um, about two-thirds of the way through, uh, and it, it examines some ideas around how, uh, around sort of the human condition related to the, whether humans are inherently good or bad, um, and and how to approach that, um, as well as sort of moving towards the technological singularity and what might happen at that point, and how all these things might interplay, and then also a post singularity scenario in which some of the some so, some of the inherent uh, psychological challenges, that, some of the inherent psychological baggage that is brought along from humanity is sort of put to the test, and eventually uh, 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 sort of. Uh, Eventually, it do, do, does push through, but um, it, 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 it takes some finagling. But anyway, that's uh, there's some details about that that I can go into right now. Uh, I'm, I'm also uh, I've also got a draft of an epic poem called the Saga of Cabaret, which mainly deals with post singularity civilizations. It's it's actually a very whimsical poem. Um, it's a it's ro it's romantic in the sense of uh, uh, relationships romance, and um, it, but it deals with super intelligent aliens, which is fun. Um, and then I've got a lot of uh, other poems, um, like Neuroweavers, Gorgeous Geometries, Electrocologies, and over here, Life Under the Microscope, um, which a lot of these deal with sort of the romance of things like nanotechnology, things like neuroengineering and synthetic biology and artificial intelligence. Um, so uh, just, I'm not going to read through the whole thing, but Life Under the Microscope here, you can see uh, Basically what I've done here is I've used these seething replicators, these uh, inquisitive nanomachines, as a metaphor for the human species itself. Um, they're in these little uh, petri dishes uh, in a lab, and they're replicating, and they're, they're, they're having all of, these, all of these different events happen to them, uh, microscopic makeup, makeout sessions, and heart support gasps of pain, and so on and so forth. And I mean, some of, these, some of these things are good, and some of them are bad, but obviously these little machines, they're very emotional. They're, they're, they're going through this evolutionary process, and they're, they're colliding, they're interacting, they're, they're, they're living their lives, and I mean, just like us. And, so, and, then, you, and then you zoom out, and you see uh, that these petri cultures, they look so small as snowflakes fall outside the lab, and, and yet, at the same time, at, at, at the end of the poem, we're left with the sense that despite, despite their smallness, there is, there is vital importance in, in, in the experiences and the emotions of these machines, and they have immense potential for becoming something much bigger, and, 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 they, 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 have, and they can bring with them the, the, the emotional richness and, and into that future. And so I, I'd just like to leave you with that um, as I conclude my presentation, because that's what I'm really trying to communicate here. Um, oh yeah, I do have a couple of final remarks just to summarize. Um, so to, uh, uh, to apply rational romanticism uh, to engineering, we're thinking about grand scale visions in combination with scientific rigor and the obsessive determination that comes from uh, having these visions that you really want to work towards. Um, and then with art uh, and communicating, um, I'm, I'm, I'm attempting to encourage a more STEM-friendly culture uh, which uh, expresses the emotional aspects of technology and its relationship to humanity in a way which can, can bridge those cultures and allow us to move into the future with, uh, with the support of the, with, with more support from the broader public and from broader academic community uh, so that we can really be uninhibited by those, um, by some of those uh, uh, interdisciplinary conflicts which are, are leading to more dystopic visions. And so, yeah, we're really we're really shooting for the stars here, and um, and with that, I'll conclude my presentation, and I'll be open to questions. <laughs>